know, what does it mean to close out a project? What does it mean to be a, prefer a project to be completion? What's the difference between substantial completion and final completion? I mean, I hate to say it, but like, that's something I didn't know for the longest time, especially if you're a subcontractor. A subcontractor, you just kind of, you don't, may not even know what the general contractor's contract looks like with the owner, right? You know, really what substantial and final completion means on that. You just know you've got to get all your stuff installed. And so <laughs> anyway, so just trying to inform people and if nothing else, just trying to like, make you realize there's something that you may not know. Welcome everybody to Construction MFers. I am excited today to introduce Matt Graves. He's someone that I met and followed on LinkedIn. I've found tremendous insight from him. Um, he kind of popped up to me rather quickly here in the last year and I've just been excited and I'm excited to share everybody his knowledge, his information. I want to make sure if you're not, follow his newsletter. Every Saturday morning, I get a chance to read it. It's full of cool little memes, great insight, good highlighted article. Matt, welcome to the Construction MFers. Hey, Scott. How are you doing, man? Good to be here. I'm doing great. It's good to finally meet you live, see your face. I know. It's uh, you and a bunch of other people. I keep circling around on LinkedIn and these other places. And then so it's finally really good to, to kind of stop and actually connect and chat with them. So it's been cool. Thanks. Well, you have a ton of experience in and around construction, particularly project management. But what I'm fascinated with is your your vision to create and be the creator and founder of Construction Yeti. And so take a few minutes. Tell us about yourself. Tell us what that is, what, how you got into it and let us know. Yeah. So I guess my background, I'll just kind of go real back real quick. I went to Texas A&M. Um, actually, I played rugby. That's where I got the hat. But anyway, uh, my hair was a mess this morning. I had to throw a hat on. Uh, anyway, so I went to Texas A&M. I got a civil engineering degree. I got halfway through engineering school and decided like, man, I do not want to be an engineer. I don't want to be like sitting at a desk, cranking out numbers all day long and don't want to do that. And so your last year, you can kind of specialize. And so you could do like transportation or structures or geotech or those sort of things. And you could do construction project management. And I was like, okay, that's cool. I'll, I'll take that route. And you take like one estimating class, one scheduling class, one you know, logistics class, one of everything, right? And you graduate and think, I know what it's like to be a construction project manager. <laughs> and you go out in the real world and you realize like, you don't know nothing about nothing. <laughs> and like my first job, they're like, all right, I need you to put together this submittal. I, was like, I don't even know what that means. And it's like, okay, well, can you write an RFI? I'm like, I don't even know what that means. <clears throat> and so I'd be sitting in meetings and the company I worked for too, we did a lot of federal contracting work. And so everywhere you're talking, it's all acronyms and, and, Turn verbiage and all these things that one, I don't even understand general construction practices for project management. Two, this whole federal thing is like there's they're just throwing out acronyms and nothing makes any sense. And so I would sit down, like I'd go sit in a meeting and like on my notepad on the right hand margin, I would just like write down every word I didn't know what it meant and just write it down. And I'd go back to my desk and just Google everything. I was just trying to learn and trying to go. Well, fast forward years and um I realized like I wasn't alone in that. When you graduate college, like I've talked to a bunch of people and like I'm not alone. When you graduate college and like you don't really understand how the real world works when it comes to construction project management. <clears throat> so then I really started construction Yeti in like January of 2020. And my idea was for it to be a blog. Because again, still I'm always learning something every day. Um, I'm always Googling something. Um, you know, construction, like the term construction is so broad. I mean, you got all the trades, you got all the everything and um, I work for an owner's rep company now, which in the past I worked for subcontractors. So you're a real niche on your, mm -hmm. your scope, right? In your trade. Um, and now I work for an owner's rep company. And so we're, we're, you know, we're kind of responsible for everything, really from design all the way to closeouts and every, you know, you got to know a little bit of our trade. So um, I still sort of live on Google where you're always kind of looking this up, trying to learn this, trying to learn this little thing. And even if you know something, there's still a dozen ways to install almost anything, right? Um, so anyway, I started, you know, anyway, so I was always on Google and I, uh, you get on Google and if you start asking real specific questions, you either end up like on somebody's blog who is like the, maybe an insurance company, but they have a, they service construction company. So they have a blog trying to get SEO traffic, right? And then you're reading, and you're like, this doesn't make any sense. Whoever wrote this has no clue what they're talking about, but they put all the keywords in there and wrote it the right way to get it, you know, to rank high in Google. Or you end up there or you end up like somewhere like Reddit and you're looking, reading Reddit and you're trying to figure out, okay, what's the BS and what's the real stuff and trying to wade your way through it. And so anyway, 
in January of 2020, I, I started a, the construction yeti.com, which was a, my idea was for it to be a blog and then really kind of just start putting these articles together and like, and really make them what I thought would be true. Right. Cause I have the experience and I'm not just reading, you know, some marketing girl who wrote some blog to put it up on the website to get SEO traffic. Anyway. So January to March, March, 2020 COVID hit. Um, I just kind of stopped paying attention to it. I got about 10 or 12 articles up before I kind of stopped. Uh, the project that I was on, project I was on at the time was a community college, and you know, and they sent. Remember back to March of 2020, they sent everybody home. The community college shut down. We didn't know if they were going to be gone for a week or a month or six months. No one knew what was happening. So, the it was we we're supposed to be working on an operating college. Well, all of a sudden, it was no longer operating anymore, and we kind of had more free reign. So we kicked our project into overdrive, and then so my any side stuff I was even thinking about playing with, it just kind of took a back seat. Um. So then that project all wrapped up, kind of COVID settled out. <clears throat> and then last June, I think it was, is when I started. Uh, I saw people doing these newsletters and I was like, man, I could do that. I could crank one of those out in like no time. I could kind of revive kind of what I was thinking with, with this blog and <clears throat> that sort of thing. And trying to like give back to the community, give back to like help those people that were in my shoes, you know, a decade, you know, 13 years ago, whenever I came out and I didn't know what I was doing. So then that's when I kind of started this newsletter. Um, and, you know, I subscribe to a number of newsletters too. And a lot of them, you know, if they're just like, you open up your email, you get this newsletter, and it's just like a rambling block of text. I just kind of skim it. Cause like, I mean, I don't have time to read that. Um, so I really try to break mine up and I put memes in there. I put gifts in there. I make a bunch of stupid jokes and just try to make it real quick bullet points. So I'm trying to teach you something. And at the same time, try to make it at least halfway engaging. And then if you are skimming, at least you can hit the bullet points and at least get the get the gist of what's going on. Um, so that's where Construction Yeti morphed from the website over to uh, to the newsletter. And then I started doing a couple, kind of just one-on-one -on -one interviews like this for the newsletter. And I created a couple of videos, put them in there, kind of interviews. And then I met Kyle Grandel kind of through all this, through LinkedIn, through it all. And we had a couple of conversations about, um, you know, we, we shared a lot of the same thoughts in the industry. It is the same way. Like he kind of like self-teach himself because he got out of school, didn't even understand what submittal was, those sort of things. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we um, realized like, Hey, there's a need for this of kind of helping the next generation. And so we was like, we talked about it. We need to do something together. I was like, let's do a, we're gonna do a podcast. And so now we're doing a podcast, the CM mentors podcast. And so the, it's just kind of been really in about, I don't know, 10 or 10 months or so. The snowballs just started rolling downhill and it's it's kind of been a fun ride yeah so that's well, uh i enjoy it i mean what dirty. i like what i like about the newsletter is one i think i, sh I shared this with you one of the first things i love that it comes on saturday morning because you know in the middle of a work day or other places it's just too hard and then what happens is for me it's something i want to read i sort of save it and leave it open and then i gotta get back to it it becomes like this like burden to some kind but saturday morning i get up i'm having a cup of coffee I, I enjoy the meme. Exactly what you said. I enjoy the meme. If I want to read something long text, I can hit the link to the article that seemed to be intriguing. If I don't, I don't have to. And I'm basically through your newsletter in five minutes. And then I can spend the next five or 10 minutes deep in it, diving deeper into something if I want. And it's cool. It sort of keeps me refreshed. I feel like um, I feel like if there's something super important I need to know, you're going to grab it on there. And if, if it's not on there, then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. You know, and then, I mean, I get things from all different places, so I'm aware of what's going on, but I, I like it for that reason. Yeah. And a lot of it too, I, I try to talk different things I've had. I mean, I've, I've been all over the place. I've talked about like my own imposter syndrome in one episode. And I talked about, you know, now I've kind of been on trying to like do more informational things. Like um, I've done like the last week I did uh you know, what does it mean to close out a project? Or what does it mean to be a preferred project to be completion? What's the difference between substantial completion and final completion? I mean, I hate to say it, but like, that's something I didn't know for the longest time, especially if you're a subcontractor. A subcontractor, you're just kind of, you don't may not even know what the general contractor's contract looks like with the owner, right? Of really what substantial and final completion means on that. You just know you got to get all your stuff installed. And so <laughs> anyway, so just trying to inform people and if nothing else, just trying to like make you realize there's something that you may not know and then maybe go if you want to learn more you can kind of go start researching on your own or something like that because i'm not trying to i'm not trying to write a textbook i'm not trying to bore you like that right. but at least it kind of gets gets you interested in it maybe 
yeah, quick hits. What do I need to know? What do I know? And if it's interesting, then people will dive deeper into it. Mm-hmm. On that topic, our a lot of our audience is subcontractors. I mean, probably a, a, the great majority. So one thing that you would tell them that they need to know as a subcontractor that if if they just did X, Y, and Z better or just did X, Y, and Z, this would 50% improve your performance or 50% improve your, your ability to do X, whatever it is you want to do. Like, what is that one or two things that if they just did, but didn't, don't, don't seem to, they could be better off. I think as it relates to the kind of their relationship, maybe with the general contractor, or even all the way through the contractor to the owner it may just be communication. Um, you know, so many subcontractors are kind of isolated sort of right. They're kind of over here working and, you know, um, I mean, I'm going to answer their phone and return emails quickly. Just like just having a communication, kind of sort of being transparent. Um, everybody feels like everything's so secretive in this industry. Um, but just, you know, if people start asking questions, a lot of times it's not because they're some of people do, but not most, most honest people in the industry aren't really trying to find something to hang you on. They're just trying to genuinely understand what's going on, trying to understand, trying to so they can forecast the project. I just think, I think a lot of subcontractors really hold all their cards tight to the vest. And maybe it's just the way the industry's been. And I do think there's a way of changing, um, but just kind of an open communication probably with the con- with the general contractor. And then me seeing it from the owner side, um, it's just a lot more helpful as you kind of see, you know, as a project's progressing and as you're trying to project out how it's going. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I just did a newsletter on abundance versus scarcity mentality. Oh, yeah. What I mean by that is it's kind of what you touched on. If if you if you are constantly looking for something negative, if you're holding everything close to the vest, you can't be surprised if everyone's holding things close to the vest and you look and they find something negative in you. It, it's what happens. And it's a, a phrase I heard one time was, if not, if not me, then who? Right. And what mm-hmm. I, I think what that was is if I see a piece of trash on the ground, if I don't pick it up, then who? Well, if I'm on a construction site and I, if I want to have an open communication with the general contractor, and I want them to tell me things that they might not tell me. Well, then if I don't just openly communicate all my things to them, how can I expect them to turn around and do it? You know, everybody's in that same bucket. Yeah. That's, I, I think the industry's, this is something I've talked to, like everybody's kind of had the same opinion of it really to talk to, but it's a very, it's an industry full of secrets. Like everyone has their secrets, but like none of them are secrets. Every, you know, everybody has the same secrets. It's okay. The same secret. And that's really something me and Kyle are trying to do with the new, with the podcast. And then with the newsletter as well is wait, let's shine some light on these secrets. Let's help the next generation. Let's like, you know, help them understand. And um, yeah, so it's just, I don't understand why everything's going to be so secretive. I do think as the generations are shifting right now, kind of in the, in the leadership positions of these companies, right? Kind of the baby boomers are retiring off, like the next generation starts taking over kind of the millennials are kind of starting to, you know, come into the, you know, into their late thirties and forties and coming into these kind of more leadership positions of the companies. I do think there's a cultural shift where that's not necessarily the same anymore. Um, mm. Maybe it's because I'm now finding myself in a more of like a, through LinkedIn and through all this more like-minded people. So maybe I'm in a bubble and that I'm kind of starting to see it shifting. Um, but I, I, the people I talk to, I think they're seeing the same thing too. So, so hopefully it's a, you know, it's going to shift and it's going to kind of just improve the industry overall. You have one secret you could share now that is not, everyone thinks it's a secret, but it's not. Oh man. Um, it's just everything. It's just like, the, you know, the fact that just people don't share what's happening to them. And like, again, it's, yeah, I keep talking about the submittal thing, but like, you know, most of the stuff, it's not a, it's not as much of a science as is an art, right? If you're writing an RFI and it's more of an art to it, right? Cause you want to like explain the problem and you want to kind of walk through the architect and the engineer. And obviously if you're on the subcontractor side, you kind of want to lead them to the answer, right? Obviously one that maybe more beneficial to the project, but more beneficial to you. But like these sort of things, they're almost like they're company secret sauces of how they do these sort of things. And I'm just using that as an example. But man, I've worked for a couple of different subcontractors and it just feels like everything they do is like their secret sauce. And I'm like, you do the same thing that everybody else does. 
but you're kind of holding the industry back by like not sharing it amongst yourselves unless you get into a, you know, some sort of peer group or something like that. But then even then you get like, um, say you're a mechanical contractor, you're a president of a mechanical contractor. You're not in a peer group with people in your region that you're competing against. You're a peer group if you're in Texas with somebody in Florida and New York and Washington, because you don't want to share your secrets. <laughs> like, it's, but it's all the same. Well, let's say, what if you, what if they share their secret, you share a secret, they share one with you. Next thing you know, you're better and you have two secrets. It's, I mean, it's only helping the industry, um, especially right now where, you know, everything's so, you know, the labor's hard to come by, um, you know, both like field labor plus, you know, I forget what it was, but AGC put out a, a stat sometime last year where I, I don't remember, I'm going to probably butcher the stat, but it was something like 91% of general contractors can't find enough project managers to fill their jobs. Um, so you hear, you know, that, you know, there's a recession and all these projects are coming down, but then again, you can't find enough people to do the job. So it's like, I don't really know what the, what the truth is. Uh, there's massive opportunities in construction for leadership. I mean, massive, you know, um, you touched on something good. I want to come back to it. So I don't forget, but you, you talked about trying to share and letting people know secrets aren't secrets. You know, everyone's yeah. doing kind of doing the same way. One of the unique things that I found in our business and what made me come out and start going on the LinkedIn, most people don't know, we've been in business for 10 years. You know, it wasn't until I didn't even put a LinkedIn thing about mobilization funding until January of 2020, ironically, I <laughs> never put a camera in front of my face until probably March or April. And the only reason I did those things was because of COVID and we didn't have anything to do. And I was like, well, I can at least help people get to banks or get to access to people that I can know. So anyway, what I what I realized is having worked with subcontractors and being on projects and the general contractor, I learned a couple key themes that I was shocked by. And what I realized was the general contractors, although what I knew was important to them by talking to them, the subs didn't know that. And what they thought that was important to the subs, they thought was something different. But what everyone was important, what everyone really was scared about was the same three things. So I feel like I was in this unique position as someone who's heavily entrenched in the construction, totally totally need the project to go very well, just like the subcontractor and the general man, the general contractor, but yet both sides think that the opposite of the other. And so I felt like it was a unique position where as someone who fin is financing either a, a, a company that's working on a project, but needs to, the project to go well for it to all work, that it's our responsibility to maybe share some of that noise, I call it, or misconceptions that aren't true. And want, you know, to give you a few is subcontractors are making, you know, 40%. Well, that's not true. GCs are holding all their money. Well, that's not true. Um, you know, like these GCs are flush with cash. And if they're whole, they can, they are, it's their job to pay me, you know, instead, if I sign this agreement. And just not understanding the waterfall of cash and like then or verse, vice versa. I've submitted my invoice, but I can't get paid. Well, did you know that the GC has to submit the invoice in a certain manner? They need this backup information. They're not, they're not just creating this to cause you stress. It's usually coming from the owner to mm -hmm. them. And by the way, it's usually going from the bank to the owner to them. And so did you know that? No, I didn't know that. And so as I started having these conversations just one-on-one -on -one, because it was a customer to customer, I realized, you know what? A lot of people are thinking these things are, are wrong. And I'll give you another one. Bidding low and then make all your money on change orders. I'm like, well, do you know that there's not a bucket called change orders that has this massive amount of money in it when they start a project? Matter of fact, there typically isn't one. And if there's, God forbid, there's one big problem on the project, that bucket's gone. So yeah. I just started talking about all these common things. And all of a sudden, I'd have people, it took a year or so, but I'd have people call me back, hey, man is it really true that there's not a change order book? And I'm like, yeah, you know, and these are real companies too, man. Not like some little, you know, we don't, we even, we don't, not like some little tiny business just started. It has like three people. And I'm talking like uh -huh. five, 10, $15 million businesses. Be like, is it really true? The banker you had on from, you know, BMO Harris, like there's not a change order bucket. They don't have that. I'm like, even contingency, I'm like, they have contingency, man, but it's not like part of a budget. It's part of a risk management tool. Right. Not, you know, and like, wow, that's fascinating. I'm like, and then I've talked to the GCs. I'm like, these guys aren't making 20 and 25%, man. And by the way, you, you say, Gee, I need subs that are flush or I'm not working with them. Well, like, what sub is flush when you hold 50% of their profit? Like nobody's flush, man. Like, uh -huh. and not only that, but no one has access to cash. So they're like, really? Like, 
I'm like, dude, <laughs> like these are just, the, so I started talking about these things for no, no other reason, just to make it like a comfortable topic for folks to discuss, because I felt like exactly what you said. If you talk about it, then everyone will be more apt to talk about it. And then you can deal with reality, you know? And then once everyone's talking to reality, you can actually come up with a solution to fix something. Yeah, that's, I mean, I'm going back to like kind of when I started off on the subcontractor side, all you knew was you kind of had your blinders on, right? And you just kind of knew about your scope. You're worried about your budgets. You're worried about these things. But again, like if you don't know kind of how, who the owner is and how the owner reacts, is it a public project, is it a private project? Like those work differently. You know, is it a, is it a hard bid project or a cement risk project for the general contractor? The subcontractors, he's usually a hard bid no matter what, right? Even if it's a cement risk, but that still affects if there is contingency or not a contingency, right? A cement right. risk project, they may have an owner's contingency and the contractor's contingency and these other things, but that's part of kind of the risk mitigation of the whole thing. And they're not easily, just because it's there doesn't mean it's easy for the taking. And so to bid low and um, try to play the change order game, that's just a bad strategy. Because I mean, you may you may make your money on this one, but you, you just you upset a lot of people along the way when every time you just, every moment you've got your hand out for stuff that even should be in your contract right and there's a time and place for change orders but um and drawings aren't always perfect and you may have you know it may have something been left out and you may be actually need money for it but you know if you're crying wolf every time something comes up it's just you know people aren't going to like that too much i guess what i'm trying to say so so what if you ever had a subcontractor come up to you on a project as the project manager and say hey look you know, Matt, look, what's perfect look like for you from me? And how can I make your life easy on this? I know how, I know how to tackle this X, Y, and Z. Let's just say it's an MEP sub. You know, I know how to tackle all the plumbing on here. That's easy. I got crews. I can do it. Obviously, we've done it before. But like, what's perfect look like for you? And how can I make your life easier before I even start? You know, has anyone ever done that? Um, I don't work for a general contractor. We're for an owner's rep. So I'm one step removed now from the subcontractors. but. I have had, when I, say I was on the subcontractor side, and we had subcontractors and vendors. Man, we had a vendor, and like I, would, I wanted to buy everything from them I could because they did just that. Um, he was basically, hey, what do you need from us? How can I make this easier for you? And we bought, you know, air hand. I was from a mechanical contract. We bought air handlers from them. We bought chillers from them. We bought, you know, the whole gamut of stuff, right? But that guy, you know, most vendors, um, it's, again, communication. And I would imagine the communication from the subcontractor to the general contractor is the same way. But every Friday in my inbox, I had a status update on the piece of equipment, the whole order, right? Here's where your air handler is. Here's where your chiller is. Here's where this thing is. Because what ends up happening is, you know, it says it's going to be 10 week lead time and you order it and you don't hear back from them for nine and a half weeks. And then they tell you you're delayed, right? <laughs> Even if you're asking for updates along the way, um, they're like, yeah, we're on track. We're on track. We're on track. And then because they're not checking with the factory, right? They place the order. You place the order with them. They place the order with them. And then nine and a half weeks, they say, yeah, you're delayed three weeks. And you're like, everything's going to come to a screeching halt because I need that air handler to come place because mm -hmm. I can't do the next thing, right? Um, I mean, just overall, I just, the ones that have really impressed me the most is the ones that really kind of over communicate um, because so much, the whole construction industry is you're building on the previous person's step. Right, you can't you can't erect the steel structure until the foundation's poured. You can't pour the foundation until the underground stuff's done, and so it's just a very incremental and people handing it off along the way. So, I, I mean, I may not be answering your question, but I do think that the ones that really kind of over deliver are the ones that over communicate really more than anything. Well, I no think you made just a good point. You've you've been hit it on a couple of times. You didn't, it's communication, and then some yeah. people are like, okay, well, what what am I supposed to communicate? Well, what you communicate simply is sometimes just think about what is better for the other person, not for you. If think mm -hmm. about how can I be in service to the project, to you who I'm working for or to the other subs to make your life easier. And that you, and you said it, you reciprocate just with, I mean, that takes maybe one minute for that person to say, how can I help you be successful on this project? But yet you change, they got back hours and hours along months and months of that entire project of them trying to help you or you try are you trying to help them right i'm going to buy from them i'm going to give them the first crack i mean you just i mean just one little nuance it's like that last i mean you played rugby it was easy to get the first 30 yards probably a lot harder to get the last right i mean exactly 
<laughs> well, no one likes surprises. So anytime you can do anything to minimize surprises, right? I mean, it doesn't matter if you if the subcontractor, if he's trying to get something from his distributor, his vendor, right? And he doesn't like a surprise because then he has to give a surprise to the GC and the GC back to the owner, to you know, the whole thing. And so um, the more you can communicate along the way, the less surprises there are. I mean, it comes to change orders too. I mean, if, you, if you're if you open and honest up front with like, hey, there's this problem and, you know, we did it this way, but it's actually this way based, you know, whatever, and you're communicating that and like, man, it's going to cost me more money. And just the communication and telling them the story about how you got there, I think a lot more general contractors and owners are more understanding and will, will be able to reach into their pocket and maybe pull out a little bit more money to make you whole because you're you're doing what you think is best or doing what, you know, is best for the project. Yeah. So when we first started, you mentioned something that intrigued me too. You said you like, you're, you're always trying to learn something, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a core value in our company is being a lifetime learner and always be learning um, for a lot of reasons. But uh, why, why is that something that you, you believe in and where did that come from? Uh, I get bored easy. And so I think for me, it's always, um, always trying to learn something new, always trying to do something different just because I, I do get bored easy. Um, we did a, I did a leadership course last year and a part of that we did the Myers-Briggs assessment. And I realized like, I'm a, I like, I'm a problem solver and I have to have a problem to solve. And if I don't have a problem, I create one. I was like, that sounds really awful. Um, you know, I'm just out here creating problems. But then when I kind of take a step back and start thinking about it and I was like, okay, maybe it's not all that bad. Maybe like the newsletter was me creating a problem because, and then I had to go solve this problem. And the same thing with the podcast um, where I've recognized a problem with like, um people maybe, maybe people are coming out of college and they're learning the textbook way of things but they're not learning the real world way of things so let me help solve that problem for them um so i think me always trying to learn something too is kind of sort of the same thing where um i'm just trying to always solve create a problem in my head then i have to go solve it right um like when i created my my website i do things the hard way <laughs> because i want to learn it the hard way but like I could have went on like GoDaddy and they got the website builder, but like, no, I want to learn how to do, I went and bought the domain here and I went and registered it here on a hosting site. And then I went on WordPress and I had to, and it probably took me 20 times longer than it should have to build it out. But like, I learned how a website works and I learned what a domain service is and all this sort of thing. So. Well, I got a piece of advice once that says when you're trying to choose the path, always choose the hardest path. <laughs> if you really, if you don't know which one to take, take the hardest one because there's the most things to learn on that path, and you'll end up at the end of it, you'll end up better off. Um, I've definitely taken that to heart. I wish I didn't take the hard path all the time, but um, <laughs> it's definitely you learn more. Um, but I found that interesting that you did that, and it serves you well because I think what you what it, what it's done or what I've seen is done now that I have that perspective, listening to you, it's put you in a position of of service. And that service with, through your newsletter or solving the problems, however you want to phrase it, but you're basically creating problems, but you're also providing solutions. And in that pro in providing those solutions that you're being in of service to others, and that methodology is going to serve you very well. So I found that fascinating, um, bringing that up. Yeah, I got to be careful, though, because sometimes I rub people the wrong way because I'm always, I don't want to say I'm creating problems, but like I sometimes want to challenge the status quo because like, just because it's the way we've always done it, is it the right way to do it? And so I'll start kind of wanting to question stuff, maybe at work or not in a bad way, not a, but you know, people, a lot of people get comfortable, right? And so it's kind of I found sometimes I can ruffle feathers at times. So it's something I got to make sure I'm conscious of when I'm doing it. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't be careful, man. I wouldn't do <laughs> things different. Um, I, I ruffled a lot of feathers in my day, um, particularly <laughs> when I didn't have my own business, but even when I did. Um, you, no one's going to talk about, or no one great has done anything that didn't ruffle feathers, you know? So right, right. I, I'd be, I would, I'd be careful. I mean, you should be kind to everybody, but you don't strike me as someone who's not kind, but you know, if you're going to ruffle some feathers, man, that's where all the juice is at. And you got to remember to fix problems. You got to shake them up a little bit. Yeah, you do. Sometimes you got to break it to be able to fix it better. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I was, in, I spent a lot of my t um, years in sales, particularly medical device sales. And I had an early manager tell me, Hey, Scott, listen, if you want to sell anything, you need to be solving a problem. I'm like, well, what if they don't have a problem? He goes, well, that's the next thing you have to be good at. You have to be good at pointing out all their problems that they don't know they have. I'm like, well, all right, what if they don't have any problems? He goes, well, then you got to be good at creating. 
<laughs> I was like, okay. So the theme is there has to be a problem in order to sell something because otherwise nobody wants to fix anything. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, there you go, man. You're doing a good job. You, you got to point them out. You're in you're in step two of that mentor's uh, advice to me. You got to sometimes you got to point out the big problem you have, and that definitely can ruffle some feathers. But if you're doing it with the right intent, which is to provide a solution to fix it then your intent is pure, then you should be able to go home and sleep well at night, regardless of whose feathers get ruffled. When your intent is not pure, then maybe you need to reconsider what you're doing. But I think you're doing a good job, man. I can, it's, it's easy for me to see that your intent is to fix and help, not to hurt and, you know, exploit. Yeah, it's, I'm just saying, you know, sometimes you start ruffling the status quo, people can start getting upset. I've, I've seen it through my whole career right oh, yeah. um, i'm not even i'm not even talking about my current employer i'm talking about previous stuff i've done but um but anyway yeah so i, I agree with that and i i mean that's kind of what i try to do with through kind of all the content i put out there too sometimes you got to kind of poke the bear or ruffle the feathers to try to get people's attention so but if you do it in a, in a good way in a, in a genuine way uh, it, it's i think people are receptive to it so you you did a podcast on imposter syndrome you were very open with that that's something that I um, struggle with myself. Matter of fact, I never knew it was called imposter syndrome until I heard a podcast on it and someone labeled it. I'm like, well, geez, I, I know that. Okay, so that's not some abnormal thing, right? And by the way, it has a name. That's cool. <laughs> like, okay, so <laughs> what? It, talk about that a little bit and your experience in it. So, I mean, I'll go all the way back to like really in 2020 when I started the website. It was called Construction Yeti and I didn't have my name on it or anything like that because I didn't want... I guess again the imposter syndrome like why would anybody want to listen to me like who really cares what i think about these things and so it, it really started with like it was construction yeti and again it just it was kind of that was like the pseudo name i had and um it didn't have my name on it and then so i was writing it and um but again like i just who cares who i am who cares what i have to say so then whenever i finally got into the newsletter it was kind of the same thing uh and so, but I kind of had to put my name on that. It was a little bit different, right? And if you're going to build a newsletter subscription, well, you got to kind of sort of market it. You got to kind of share it on LinkedIn and just share it on these sort of things. So it kind of kind of broke down that, um, you know, anonymous wall I, that sort of had, you know, from the, from the website. But again, like, man, one of the scariest times of my life was like when I first put out the link, the first LinkedIn post where I like just announced what I was doing. Um, and I've had all these ideas, like, I want to go do this. I want to go do that. I never did any of it. I think kind of the imposter syndrome held me back a lot of, you know, why would, why does anybody care what I, why would I would do it? All these sort of things. And so one day I finally decided like, I'm going to do this newsletter thing. And I went and signed up on Substack and I, I wrote up a LinkedIn post and said, Hey, I mean, I forget what I said, but basically like, Hey, I'm going to go do this newsletter thing. Like, here's the link, go subscribe. If you want to follow me, this is what I'm going to kind of do. And like the moment I hit publish or send on LinkedIn, like my heart stopped. I was just like, oh man, here we go. Like just that putting yourself out there. And yeah. like, I mean, I didn't know where it was going to take me. I didn't, I mean, I obviously didn't think at that point it was going to become like doing interviews like this with you or, you know, doing my own podcast or all these sort of things. But just like that moment was like the scariest moment of my life. <laughs> of like, man, people are going to tear me to shreds. People are going to like think like, who is he and why does he think like anybody cares and all those sort of things. Um, and once you, once you realize like, well, some people will care and some people won't care, but the people who won't care won't subscribe and they won't, they don't care about you as much as you think they care about you. It kind of was a big relief. Well, what's cool about that is, is you, you hit the nail on the head, you lean into that fear. And then you, as soon as you get to the other side of it, there's like all these great gifts that you get from it. Right. And it's, and look like now two short years later, almost three or three short years later, you're already beyond that. Right. And now you're doing a podcast on it and where, where the benefit and the value is, is now sharing that story for the other folks that are sitting there right on the edge of doing something cool that could help other people by sharing their own fear and, and boom. But to talk about what, what is imposter syndrome? Like to find that for everybody. Well, for me, it's, it was just, you know, again, like, why do people care who I am? Or why do people care what I have to say? Right? Because if you're putting out, and like, I hate the term thought leader, but if you're putting out these thought leader things, right, where you're trying to share your insights or share kind of your experiences on social media, whether it be LinkedIn, whether it be, um, you know, a newsletter like that. And what I mean by newsletters, like, you know, it, it, some people are like sharing 
like actual news, right? They condense news, but mine is more of like just trying to help teach kind of the next generation something, or even people um, that are kind of on the outside of the construction industry. I have a lot of like recruiters that follow it, a lot of, uh, you know, finance people that follow it that where they work in construction, sort of around construction, but not the actual construction people. Um, So they hear stuff like, you know, substantial completion, and they don't have no clue what that means because, but they hear it all the time. And so being able to just kind of real easily explain it to them. But again, back to the imposter syndrome thing, for me, it was just, you know, I felt like an imposter. I didn't feel like I was the person. I'm just a, just a dude managing construction projects, you know, in, in Houston right now. Like, why does anybody care what I really think? I'm just another person, right? Um, but that kind of, I think, helped me relate to people because I am just another dude doing managing construction project, right? But I'm sharing my experiences and sharing my insights. Um, but breaking through that wall of, of feeling like an imposter, feeling like I don't belong. Um, Cause you go on LinkedIn and you find people with like, I think when I first started this, um, I really didn't use LinkedIn much until I started the newsletter and then you have to market it. So then I started posting more on LinkedIn and again, snowball started rolling. I probably had like 500 subscribers or followers or whatever you call it on there. Um, and now I'm up to like 3000, but you go on there and you see people with like 20,000 and 10,000 and you're like, man, I don't belong with those people. And um, you know, they're, they're really making it happen. And you realize like, they're just another dude. They're just another girl just doing the same thing I'm doing. Right. Um, And I've, one thing that really kind of helped me is like, I've had a lot of cool conversations with people and people that like, like you, you know, people reaching out to me and like, like, man, I, why do you want to talk to me? I'm, I'm a nobody. Right. (laughs) Like when you start realizing like, you one you are sort of a nobody but everybody's sort of a nobody right like we're all kind of the same trying to figure this out together um it kind of helps you break through that yeah when you realize how many billion people are in the world and someone has three thousand followers seven thousand twenty thousand you're like we're all really nobodies in the same (laughs) but all you really have to do is be somebody to one person and that's it when i send those newsletters or a post out Right. I thought I could, I, man, I must have felt the same exact way you did. I was scared. I was sweating. I was thinking like, oh my gosh, it's going to be terrible. Like, but you know, I got something to say that I think people need to know, right? Whatever it is. And so I, I know one person's going to like, cause I'm, I'm going to, all I'm going to do is say the same things I said in private that people have said, oh my gosh, thank you for saying that. Or this is great. And um, I remember being nervous and scared and they, and they said, just hit send, man. You know what? Let me tell you what, there's going to be people that hate it. And there's going to be people that like it. Mm-hmm. This just help this. If you can get one person that reads it, that it helps, then you should be, that's all you should focus on. So when you're doing it, just do it for one person. I'm like, well, that's easy enough. I can do that. And, and that perspective helped me a lot get through that early phases. Cause I felt the same way, man. I really did. Um, and then the gifts I've gotten now from that three years removed, I mean, you and I are pretty much on the same exact time frame path. I, I, they're indescribable. I can't even de- de- describe how like personally, professionally, our business, the company, um, cool things I've been able to do or talk to or information I've learned. It's just been, it's been really a cool, rewarding uh, experience for me, but I never was doing it for me really, you know, and that's the, that's the interesting part. Yeah. Same thing. Like, man, just like the network and the people I've met through it all, you know, again, like people's reached out to me, like just people, people reach out to you and you're like, you think they're way outside of your your bubble right they're way above you you think and then you, you talk to them you get on a zoom call you get on whatever and you just like you start realizing like we're all just people trying to try to make it in this world <laughs> like yeah. it's uh it's, it's a little humbling so it's cool what's what's cool about it what i would encourage anyone to know too is when you when you do finally talk to that person you you walk away and you're like there's a normal person man. that person's cool like a regular they do everything the same way as i do you know and yeah, I remember I had a boss um, when I was 21, I was working for Aramark Corporation at Disney World. They say did all the food service for all the employees. And there was this guy, his name was Ricky. And Ricky was like, he's probably 40 at the time, right? You know, he's 20 years older. Ricky had a suit on. He was smooth. Ricky could talk. He could. He was hobnob with everybody. He was cool with the clients and he was cool with the employees. And he also had like good systems. And I had this impression of him. That was, you know, he was, he was cool. He got it. Like he was good. And uh, I heard other people talking, Ricky's a man. Oh, the fact you're working for Ricky, that's going to be great. Oh, you got to put a Ricky spot. That's great. So I was always intimidated. But then one day I sat with Ricky, he called me in his office and I sat with him to talk. And I realized, man, this is just a normal dude. (laughs) He said that. 
And you know what he said the difference is? He goes, Scott, I'm 41 years old. I've been doing this for 20 more years than you. That's all it is. <laughs> I've made 50,000 mistakes and I learned a little something from half of them. And the other half I was too stupid to learn from. And that's it. Like, and I still got a whole bunch to go. And I was like, wow, it's so normal. So it's a great perspective to have. And I, I was, that was such a gift to, at 21 to be able to get that like four months into my job. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was the, I can't tell you anything else that I learned from Ricky with that one piece is I've never forgotten. And it's just carried me forward. So I think it's, I think you're right. And just jump. Yeah. And I think anybody who's like maybe on the edge of wanting to start something or at least maybe, you know, posting on LinkedIn or trying to share their thoughts or trying to connect with people, like just do it. Like, again, people don't, you're, we're on the outside. You think, I think it's called like the spotlight syndrome or something like that, where you think everyone's looking at you. Mm-hmm. And then I'll tell you just through like my 10 months of really kind of going hard on this is like, nobody really cares about you that much. They're really looking at themselves and thinking everybody's looking at them and everyone, you know, so we're all kind of the spotlight, everybody thinks the spotlight's on themselves, but um, everyone's just really worried about their own life, their own job, their own family, their own everything. And um, you just kind of come and go through their life. And if you can kind of help them along the way, you know, do it. Yeah, that phrase, uh, Cameron Haynes, you know Cameron Haynes, the uh, bow hunter? Uh, no. He, he's a great um, guy to follow, wrote a, wrote a great book called uh, Endure. Endure. Okay. And uh, he, his motto is nobody cares. <laughs> nobody, nobody cares where Carter. And the truth oh, is, yeah, nobody really cares. I mean, we all care, but nobody cares. You know, you care for a minute, but you're not going to care for as forever. So you have to be able to find your ways to fulfill yourself um, along the way. I have heard that quote. I, I love it. Nobody cares. Work harder. But he's great. Follow. You would like him a lot. Listening to you and watch what you write about. But Cam- Cameron Haynes is a good, good dude to follow. I think he might have just started a podcast too. I haven't heard it yet, but uh, great book, by the way, um, and a great, great journey he talks about. I'm writing that down. So, in wrapping this up, I want to to ask you just a few quick hitting questions. Um, back to construction subcontractors, right? If you were starting a construction subcontracting business today, the things you've seen moving away from as a, moving away from the subcontractor side and into the owner's rep side. What would be a few things that you could discuss or tell that subcontractors could do right now today to make a big difference for themselves? Like what are the best, what are the best subcontractors do? I think train their people. Um, and what I mean by that is like, you know, I think if I was going to start a subcontracting business and what, you know, when you first start out, it's probably, you, right? You're a plumber. You're a really good plumber and you want to do something more. So you, you quit your job and you go start your own plumbing company, right? And then as you grow and you grow and you hire somebody, you hire somebody, you hire somebody and you wake up one day and you're a $20 million plumbing company and you've got five or six project managers and you've got these superintendents and all these things, but like really training them well and putting in, really investing in the people like that. Um, I've seen a lot of subcontractors that'll hire somebody or maybe they hire him fresh out of school and they say you know you're assistant project manager just go learn from him well that guy that you put him under may not be a good really a good leader a good trainer or anything like that but really having a um, kind of structured training program having a um, kind of like a from the project management side like a project management procedures manual like this is how we do business and really training your people on that um you know, otherwise you hire this person, that person, this person, and they all kind of go their own way and they're all doing things different. And if a client works with, you know, Joe on this project, they're going to have one experience. And if they work with Bob on this project, they're going to have a different experience, but kind of trying to make it, um, you're not trying to take it away and make everybody robots, right? But trying to make everything a little bit more consistent. And then if Bob gets hit by a bus or Bob quits and leaves, at least you kind of pick up where he was at because you kind of know how we're doing things. Um, I think really training people, investing people, um, I think social media marketing is really huge. Um, I think a lot of, uh, subcontractors are scared of that. Um, I think the industry as a whole, the construction industry as a whole is scared of social media. Um, and I mean, rightfully so I, I can't count on two hands. How many times I've seen somebody do real stupid something on the job site and put it on, you know, they're wearing their company, hard hat company vest, and they're doing something stupid, some safety, big thing and putting on Facebook or putting on TikTok where everybody sees it. Right. And it kind of gives both the company a, a black eye and really the industry as a whole a black eye. But I think too, 
encouraging your people to do to maybe training them on how to like really professionally but organically do social media too um <clears throat> a lot of companies especially if you're starting out again you're sort of a nobody right you guys start building these relationships with the general contractors with maybe the owners with you know if you're a plumbing company right you can go you can go work directly for an owner right if they need some plumbing services to help you know, maybe it's a, a call a school or a college or something and they need an outside company to come help them with their trade work right to help supplement their man, uh, maintenance staff but um really trying to develop those relationships and i think social media is a really one it's a, it's free for the most part right i mean you do paid mm-hmm. ads but um and obviously it costs you a little bit to create the content because you're you're generally paying somebody to do it but um, you're not buying a magazine or a billboard, right? Which is going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars for each one. Right. So I think those are a couple of things. Um, could it. help help people get on their feet anyway. And if you could go back to the very beginning when you walked into the construction industry on day one, what's the one piece of information you wish you knew then that you have learned along the way? Um, man, I think, I think when I first got out of school, it's kind of I've kind of had this realization a couple times throughout my career. But when I first got out of school, you think of a business as like this magic entity, right? I mean, you kind of grow up and you think these businesses are these magical things and like they're perfect. But when you get in the when I for me when I got in the real world, I realized like business is just kind of made made up by just a, a few people who just made something up and they're trying to do something. It's not really it's kind of that imposter syndrome again, right? Um, you just kind of realize and this is probably makes no sense to anybody, but it's a couple of times I've had this realization of like it, a business is purely just somebody's brainchild that they put it together and it starts going and it's not perfect and it's messy and you're going to screw up along the way and that's okay. Just try to make it, try to do everything the best of your ability and try to do everything genuine and don't screw people as you go and um, you'll be all right. And I don't think you could have ended it any better than that. <laughs> That's perfect. Matt, thank you very much for coming on and sharing your uh, wisdom and your insight and just perspective. I think your your journey's cool. I like what you're doing a lot. It's really helped me. I honestly tell you at Saturday mornings, I, I look, look forward to your newsletter. Um, and, and I don't read a lot of newsletters, to be honest with you. I really don't. I get a lot of them, but I don't read them all. Um, but I do get to yours and I, I like it and I think you should keep doing what you're doing and I'm glad you're past your imposter syndrome and you're going and I appreciate you sharing because I've had the same feeling myself along the way. I appreciate it, Scott. I mean, I think what you're doing is huge too because I mean, like cash flow and cash management, I mean, it's something that really a lot of people don't really recognize. Maybe the owner of the, you know, talking about subcontractors, maybe the owner of the company realizes it's important, right? Because they're seeing the bills come in and they're seeing how much money they have in the bank. But I think literally, I mean, I read your book, you sent me a copy and I appreciate that. I read it. I think like every owner of every contractor should give it to like every entry level employee and say, read this because it, I mean, most of it may go over their head because they don't have the experience yet, but it'll start, it'll start helping them understand what that really means for the business. And so anyway, I think, I think you're doing a good job too, man, sharing your knowledge. Well, I appreciate it very much. How can everybody find you? Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, that's probably the best social platform to find me on. Um, uh, my name on there is Matt Graves PMP. There's probably 30,000 Matt Graves on there, but I think I may be the only one with the PMP. So that's my name on there. Um, and also the, uh, construction Yeti, it lives on Substack. So you can go to constructionyeti.substack.com. And that's the, the construction curiosities newsletter and the, uh, podcast, CM Mentors podcast hosted through there. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, man. I appreciate you coming on. You have an awesome rest of your day. And I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Uh, I hope Please support Matt. Please go get his newsletter, subscribe to it. And if you like what we put out here today, please subscribe to the channel. And we look forward to you guys and seeing you again. Thank you all very much. Matt, be good. Thanks, Scott. Got it. <laughs>